This is Professor Frank Crawford from University of New England interviewing Professor Karen Stoller at the 10th International Congress of Qualitative Inquiry. Tell us who you are. I am Karen Stoller from the University of Michigan School of Social Work, and I'm also the editor of Qualitative Social Work Research and Practice, which is a, a journal started by Ian Shaw and Roy Rakhtashel, um, and it was a place to publish qualitative social work. I thought you'd be the ideal person to speak of the value for social work practice and practitioners of writing and publishing. Yeah, the journal um, was founded when there was real dearth of places to put experimental or different kinds of writing for social workers, for social workers doing qualitative research. Um, as I said, Roy Rakhtashal and Ian Shaw sort of founded it in 2001. But they did so with also with Robert, Robin Munford, who is in New Zealand. Um, but the focus of the journal was always very international. Um, so when we have articles reviewed, as you know, um, we get scholars from all over the world to look at them for peer review and that kind of stuff. But Roy and Ian also wanted to um, really embrace different kinds of writing and um, different forms of scholarship, but also really wanted to honor different voices. So I'm really pleased that you're asking about social work practitioners because we've worked, um, we've wanted very much to include practitioner voices in this journal, but often that practitioner voice is lost, and yet we've carved spaces for that in the journal. We have a section called New Voices, which we had hoped would be voices from the field <laughs> um, and alternative forms of writing and that kind of thing. And we also have a section on commentary where we ask just for critical conversations, and we would love it if it was better informed mm -hmm. by social work practice, because too often there's sort of a gap between the knowledge producers in university settings and the real work that social workers are doing in the community. And how do you think that gap has emerged? Because certainly it wasn't there at the beginnings of social work. It's, it's true, and I, um, I teach a history and philosophy of social welfare course and um, sort of trace some of the early roots of, of social work. Social work practice and really started with sort of two, two different strains is, is the way I talk about it a little bit. It, during the progressive era, the 18, late 1800s, early 1900s, um, and there were the sort of settlement house workers. The, for us, it was Whole House, Jane Addams, and that group of, of women who really did um, produce sort of social statistics as a way of documenting conditions with the belief that if you documented that it would lead to social reform. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I also take note of the fact that a lot of those women were educated, women who were um, barred from teaching in the disciplines where they got their degrees, like mm -hmm. sociology and uh, uh, economics, because they were women and they weren't welcoming the academy. So mm -hmm. that they, they started schools of social work where you could really deal with applied or direct practice kind of interventions. A second thread, I think, is the charitable organization societies, um, where there was, was more focus was on case-based uh, case research or, or case-based um, knowledge development. I'm thinking now of people like Mary Richmond, who sort of took medical diagnoses or that kind of idea and applied it to social conditions and then sort of worked from there. I certainly argue in the 1960s and 70s, and I don't, you, maybe you're probably following suit. We were following, well. we were a bit later than that. Okay, we started creating uh, doctoral programs in social mm -hmm. work, which meant that people were graduating from universities with PhDs, and their trainings were primarily in social science and in research methodologies. And so faculties in schools of social work, in a way, changed or shifted from being direct social work practitioners with real-world experience to these formally educated social scientists. And that created, I think, a kind of gap <laughs> between who was creating knowledge and then the people out there that, was that were actually 
performing or doing social work. And that's just, a, a, I think we've spent a lot of time since then trying to, talking about bridging the gap. But at least in the U.S., all too often the conversation is about uh, trying to educate practitioners to understand the importance of what academics produce rather than really hearing from social work practitioners uh, about what they're doing and what they've learned in the process of doing it, which is why I would so urge your students or, or uh, you know, practitioners who come through the programs to just start writing and reflecting about those experiences. They're really important for the knowledge base mm-hmm. for social work. And they don't, I, I know social work practitioners just are really busy doing their real jobs. And so writing about it is an added burden. But um, it's beneficial to all of us if they're part of that conversation. Thanks. So, Karen, I understand you were a practitioner before you did completed your PhD. Can you tell us a bit about your journey from practice to becoming the editor now of a um, well, this is top the, journal plus an this is going to be writer. Fran. This is going to be really embarrassing because I actually don't have a master's degree in social work. Um, my legal my training is in law. I have a law degree, um, but I began. After graduating from law school, I began um, practicing public interest law in New York City. Um, And public interest law, by my definition, is you work the same hours as corporate lawyers, but you're doing, you're working with mostly poor and disadvantaged folks. Um, And you're sort of confronted with poverty and institutional racism and those kinds Mm -hmm. of issues. Mm -hmm. And I quickly learned that. as a lawyer, I could sort of patch, I could do some patchwork fixing of people's lives. I mean, maybe I could stop an eviction or something mm-hmm. like that. But I wasn't dealing with the real structural kinds of social issues that were creating the problems in the first mm-hmm. place. So I quickly learned that I needed to work hand in hand with social work practitioners to just do the job of, of a legal services lawyer. And then I think, like many of us in academics, um, I sort of thought if I went back and got one more degree, I might be able to solve all of society's problems, which is obviously not going to ever happen. But I went back when I decided to go back to school for a PhD. I ended up in a social work program, so my PhD is in social work. But I did that largely because um, the value base of the social work profession, sort of social justice and oppression and those kinds of issues, that, that those values were where my heart was. And it felt like the professional, you know, the educational place to res- to sort of be informed, mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. have that work informed, would be social work. So that's where I ended up going back to school. But and so. what was your topic? Oh, uh, and my dissertation topic was uh, uh, on runaway and homeless youth and sort of the 1960s counterculture that influenced the development of policy and programs in this country. Um, I don't know if you have the equivalent, but we have these, uh, I think the names are now sort of unfortunate, but runaway and homeless youth crisis shelters, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where kids who who have been kicked out of home or need to leave for one reason or another can, can get sort of crisis shelter. That's evolved into also sort of transitional living programs for kids that are particularly at risk. Mm-hmm. Um, and so my dissertation really looked at that. That was a really radical service model in the 1960s. Um, you know, up until that point, we were sort of in car- well, we're still doing it, but at the time, we were really incarcerating kids. We were sort of locking them up for being different mm. and penalizing them for living in poverty, basically. And so it was kind of a, the, this notion that they could access service themselves without a judge or a, you know, some a mental health authority, mental health authority, ordering them into some sort of treatment. The fact that they could access service themselves was a really radical idea, and I really, I think it comes from the 1960s cult, counterculture. Mm-hmm. I'm really interested in the writing aspect of your trajectory from there. When did you begin to become such a prolific writer and then become the editor? Of quality and social work? Oh, well... They had, I, don't, I hardly consider myself a, a prolific writer. It's like painful. Every, every time I try to write something, it's like giving birth to some new project. But um, um, I, I, t- 
took a position at the University of Michigan, which is like, um, uh, top it's a, it, well, social it's a, okay. work program. It's, you know, say. by all those rankings that I find ridiculous, it's the number one school of social work in the United States. But it also um, prides itself in what I consider a sort of more institutionalized, mm -hmm. positivistic yeah. tradition for the most part. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of a, a lone voice. Um, there were a few colleagues that did qualitative work, but it was sort of relatively marginalized. So a year after I started in that program, or started with my academic appointment, this journal came into existence. And then a couple of years later, this Congress came, came into in existence. I think it was 2005, I guess. So if, if I trace my own personal history, um, I started a year later. I had a home to put my research. And then this conference became a, a place or a home to kind of talk about the research. So those, those influences really, really shaped uh, they gave me the 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 kind of academic outlets that you need as a, mm -hmm. as a young scholar to sort of survive, and they great this place has really influenced my understanding of the politics of science and the politics of evidence and to raise concern about who writes about what for whom <laughs> kind of um, and so much of my scholarship has been looking at. Um, sort of writing about or looking at the politics of, of science and inquiry in the mm. academy. And, and so, yeah. for a, an aspiring practitioner, aspiring yeah. to write in Australia at the moment, mm -hmm. what would qualitative social work publish? I suspect that your practitioners and your students could tell me what I should be pu publishing, and I'd love to hear it from them. But, the you know... Things that I can think of are the day-to-day -day ethics of practice or mm -hmm. the particularly nettlesome problems or solutions that they come up with. Um, I, I'm working with Ozone House, which is a little local runaway and homeless youth shelter in my community. And they, my, those incredibly gifted social workers, and, and they're just talented and creative, they keep turning to me for the best practices produced by the academy and I keep saying you guys what you live and do here every day is far more inspiring and useful mm -hmm. than what we produce and I would love for your students to start taking seriously writing those kinds of things I, um, I so think thick description thick thick Description, real experiences, and I know you worry about the ethics of mm. clients. And, mm. you know, oh, well, and stuff given stuff. that, of course, of course, um, dilemmas that they face, mm. um, networks that they build. I do, any of those narratives or stories about their practice would be useful. I'll give you one example. Mm. In this new voices section, um, I wrote an article. Um, no, I didn't. I, I listened to a practitioner who I had great an, uh, uh, admiration for. Her name's jo Joanne Terrell. And she does death penalty mitigation in the state of Alabama in the United States. Death penalty mitigation being the last bit of test. We have the death penalty in this country in some states. It, and it's a terribly racist policy. I mean, it's the people who are subject to it are poor people people, often people of color. It's a terrible social justice issue. Um, but often, the only person sort of standing in the way of a death penalty sentence um, and life in prison without the possibility of parole, which mm -hmm. is the option, are, so, are social workers who can testify to mitigating factors in people's lives that have got them to the point in mm -hmm. their lives where whatever awful thing happened, mm -hmm. happened. Well, Joanne is way too busy to write up those experiences, and yet she's just this wealth of knowledge about how you put together those cases mm -hmm. or how you talk to a jury or how you talk to attorneys. And um, so we co-constructed an article for the New Voices section that was really her history and experience. And I wrote it because she didn't have the time or the space or the energy to do that. I, I suspect your students do have, maybe not the time and the space, but they have the skill set to do it if they make the time for it, and they're incredibly... I, 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 just, I, I can't emphasize enough how much 
we'd love to hear their voices. Um, well, but you offer a different model, and I think we could have all these forms of people writing their own sure. practice stories, but also collaborating with others on having them recorded. And I'd just like to finish, I know that we've got sure. sessions to go to, but to finish, given the documentation now lost, not lost in history, but a long time ago it was started yeah. by the yeah. pioneers of social work, mm -hmm. What do you see as the value of documenting social work today? I, well, you're tapping into a, a much-loved topic for me. I've done um, my next huge scholarship project actually looked at um, um, case records of the Children's Aid Society from 1860s into the 19th, 1900s. Um, and I'm, they have, at the New York Historical Society, Oh, I'm forgetting how many hundreds of thousands of client case records that were preserved. And at the time, case records included full narrations, it included correspondence, it included these portraits of the work they were doing and the client's lives. Mm -hmm. And I feel to some extent our casework has lost a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. It's become sort of protective and defensive. Mm -hmm. But I can't emphasize enough how much I think those case records are, they capture people's lives, they capture the work social workers do. And so not only are they important for the actual practice, they're important as historic records of what the profession does. So I always ask my students to take seriously what they write down um, because it'll get used in all sorts of different ways. Thank you. Is it? Thank you.